have your Bibles, we'll turn with us to the book of Mark, chapter number 5. Mark, chapter 5. So excited about what God is doing. Thank you for your prayers as I recovered from a twisted knee and uh, walking today with no pain. Hallelujah. I serve a great big God. He is a healer. Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse number 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Somebody say, that's a long time to be sick. Maybe you've never been sick very long. And I'm telling you, one day is a long time to be sick. Notice verse number 26 is very important. And had suffered many things of many positions. And had spent all that she had. Let me tell you something. You can spend every dime you got going to every doctor you can find. And I'm not against doctors. But I'm here to tell you they don't have the solution. Jesus has the solution. Jesus has the solution. You know, in our offering today that we receive, we're receiving an offering. If you didn't put yours in, you can do it on Tuesday. But we're receiving a special offering to help in the Philippines. There are a lot of people in need from the disaster that struck there. And on Wednesday, Sister Yogi Sineo will be flying to the Philippines to take some disaster relief funds there that will help with that. But even carrying those funds are not going to solve the problems in the Philippines. The only thing that's going to solve the problem is to get the problem to Jesus. If you get the problem to Jesus, all these other things will help. But the Bible said that this woman had spent all that she had and suffered many things at the hands of physicians. And had spent all that she had and was nothing the better, but rather grew worse. She was down to nothing. She was broke, busted, and disgusted. When she had heard of Jesus, verse 27, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Understanding the law of her day was she was considered unclean so she couldn't shake his hand. That was the law of the day. She could not touch him. But she said, if I can't touch him, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I have enough faith to believe that something will happen. Where's your faith today? Verse number 29, and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest, you see what's going on around you. The multitude knowing in thee. And thou sayest, Who touched you? What's wrong with you, Jesus? We all bumped into you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, hearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, everybody say, Daughter. The only time in the entire Bible Jesus never used the word daughter. But he was addressing somebody. He said, Damsel arise when he was talking to Jairus' daughter. But when you call somebody your daughter, you just take the possession and ownership. Mine. Here was a woman that was busted, disgusted. And Jesus calls her. He said to her daughter, Thy faith that made thee whole, go in peace and be whole of thy faith. I want to preach a little while today. When I'm down to the God of the Son. When I'm just down to nothing. When I don't know what I'm going to do next. When I don't know where I'm Jesus, thank you for your word today. I pray right now that 
that word becomes alive in every heart. Anoint me to minister to these precious people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. About a month ago, I began a message I simply entitled the, the beautiful part of nothing, or the miraculous part of nothing. I don't know what I entitled it then. But nothing is, is an empty word. Even when you try to describe it, I said you can't even describe nothing. You can't define it. it. It's no thing. It's nothing. It's not anything. It's something that doesn't exist. It, uh, you know, we, we have trouble defining what nothing is. We may not be able to define it, but we know what it is. We know what it is when we are down to nothing. I'm reminded of a, a young man or a middle-aged man that prayed through when I was a teenager in one of our youth services. Ross Riles was his name, and his wife actually was a youth leader at the church, and Ross had never been to church bus. He would always come and sit in his truck outside, but the night that he came to youth service, and the night that he came to an altar, and the night God filled him with the Holy Ghost, he would testify later, and he said, all of my life, since I was just a little boy, I would do odd jobs because I always needed to feel like I had some money in my pocket. He said, we were so poor. He was the son of a preacher. He said, but we were so poor, I never had any money in my pocket. He said, so all of my life, all of my teenage life and adult life, I've always prided myself in having money in my pocket. He said, but the night I got the Holy Ghost, uh, I reached into my pocket when I pulled up at the church to drop my wife off to go to church. He said, and I reached in my pocket to get some money to see if I would go to the store not have one nickel to my name. He said, I sat in that truck as she walked into church that night, and I began to think, this is the first time you've been down to nothing. He said, I began to think all my bills were paid, but I'm broke. I'm down to nothing. He said, and I thought, why am I sitting out in the truck with nothing in my pocket while there's people inside that church that are getting something from God. He said, I realized, he said, God had to get me to a place that I was broke before I realized I was also busted and disgusted without God. He came into that service that night. God brought him to an altar. He brought himself to an altar and God filled him with the Holy Spirit that night. Why? Because he realized he was tired of getting by on nothing. You know, we, we know what we think nothing is. It's an emptiness. It's a void. It's just not there. And we know what nothing is good for. It's good for nothing. Right? <laughs> you were waiting on it. I thought I'd have to do it. it, it that, that's all nothing is good for. It's nothing. We, we look at our situation sometime and we think that uh, we're, we're, we, we can do nothing with nothing. Because you can make nothing out of nothing. We look at nothing and we realize it's useless. It's helpless. It's hopeless. And that's our concept of that. But you see, God has a different concept. When God looks at nothing, He sees potential. He sees an opportunity. He sees you whenever you're ready to throw your hands up and say, I quit because I can't do anything. God said, that's when I can do everything. You see, when we get over ourselves, then we realize that the God we've been looking for is there. When we tell ourselves, I can't do it, God says, with me, all things are possible. There's something about serving a God that delights in doing the impossible. Love. The God that stood on nothing and spoke to nothing and created a world when He said, let there be, and there was. He is the God that speaks to nothing and something always happens. In the midst of the storm, when the winds were raging and the waves were crashing, he said, Peace, be still. And when he did, the sea became as glass. When there was nothing to be had for lunch, except the little kid's lunch, God said, Let me bless it, then we'll break it. Hear me today. You may look at your situation and say, There's nothing I can do with it. 
You can, but wait till God blesses it. Wait till God breaks it down. Wait till God breaks you, because God uses broken things to accomplish His will. The story we read to you today, the Bible says that she had suffered many things and was nothing the better. Now you understand that in the Old Testament or in the New Testament either, there were so many traditions that people followed. There were people that believed, I don't know, I grew up in the South, and maybe you never grew up in the South and you didn't hear some of the things that I heard growing up. If you got a wart on you, it was because you picked up a frog. That's what they believed. And if you wanted to get rid of that wart, they would tell you to do all kind of crazy things. You know, they would tell you that if you would bury an egg for so long and, and then you would come back and that egg, you know, that was witchcraft. I didn't know what it was. I was just a kid. I mean, whatever. My granddaddy, if he saw a black cat run across the road in front of him, he would put an egg from the windshield. <laughs>
You just reach that point that I just got to have some relief. I just got to have some help. I just got to get rid of whatever it is that bothers me. When you've been hurting bad enough, there'll come a time that you just say, look, whatever it takes, I just want to get better. When you get sick and tired of sin off and up, you're going to reach a place in your life where you say, God, I'm sick and tired of living the way I've been living. I've been trying to do it my way, and I'm down to nothing, God. It's just not working for me. I need some help, God. I need to be set free from what I've been going through. Bible. Tells the story in the book of 2 Kings. Read it for me, 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to read it from verse 1, please. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? I said, what do you want me to do for you? She said, my husband was a preacher and he died broke. I don't know why preachers die broke, but we do. I guess it's because we put everything we got back into work. But he, she said, he, he, he was a good man, but now the bad part is he died young and they come to get my two boys as bondsmen. Because you see, in those days, if you didn't pay your bills, they come to take your kids away. You had to work until they paid the bill off. And, and she comes to the preacher, to the prophet, and says, now what should I do? He said, what do you have in your house? He said, what do you have in your house? She said, thy handmaid has not anything in the well, house. Well, listen to this. Say, I don't have pot pot anything. Pot. Except, oh, that old pot of water. Let me ask you something today. What are you down to? In your situation, what are you down to today? Well, I don't have two cars before. I got one car. I don't even have a car. I got a bicycle. I don't have a bicycle. I got a skateboard. And maybe you just play a step and catch it. Maybe you just walk. I don't know. But what are you down to today? When you really feel like you're down to nothing, what are you really down to? She said, I don't have anything in my house except a pot of oil. And an oil is no good by itself. There's nothing you can eat with oil. An oil sandwich doesn't taste good. You know, and my fried oil, all I'm going to have is fried oil. That's all there is. There's nothing left. I'm down to nothing. Read. He said, go borrow the vessels abroad of all the neighbors. He said, you go and get a bunch more vessels from all of your neighbors. But what? I've got nothing but a pot of oil. Why do I need more vessels? I got a pot of oil. And you want me to go, you know what? Sometimes what God tells you to do is not going to make any sense. You got to get over yourself to get what God wants. You got to get yourself out. Well, I just don't believe in that. I don't want to raise my hand. I don't want to worship God. I don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to go to the law. I don't want to worship. I don't want to do anything. I want to sit right here and God touch me and do it my way. You had just some strength stuff on you. God is not going to do things your way. He's not going to let you keep on doing things your way because we do them your way has got you where you are right now. There's got to be something inside of you that says, hey, I'm ready to make a change. Let me tell you something. When you get ready to make a change, God will show up and make a change. God will do it. Just about a month ago, not quite a month ago, we baptized Sister Beyond's mom and dad in Jesus' name. Her dad was 82 years old. We baptized him in Jesus' name. And I'm going to tell it just the best way I know it. If I get it wrong, she'll straighten it out later. But let me tell you something. That little precious couple, her mother was Buddhist. Her dad had begun to go since Ron and Beyond went for vacation over there. They had carried him to a church and he'd been going, but Mama said, no way. No want no part of that. Not going. But guess what? Just before they came to America, the pastor from that church stopped by to see them. And she said, when I get back, I'll go to church. Well, she didn't wait till she got back. When she got here, they came to service after service after service. Uh, we were able to find on global, globaltracks.com website, which is part of the United Pentecostal Church website. We were able to find some global tracks that were printed or written in Korean. 
And Mion began to get those Bible studies for herself and share them with her mom and her dad. And before they left here, they wanted to be baptized in Jesus' name. And were baptized in both. But that's not the end of the story. They went back home. And Mion has a brother that lives with them that's total Buddhist. And they were not knowing what to say to him or how to say anything to him about them being baptized in Jesus' name and what God had done in their lives around here. And so they were just going through all the pictures that they had. And he was looking through all the places they went to the Grand Canyon and all the things they saw. And he came to the picture of the baptism. And he says to mom and dad, what are you doing in these robes? And they said to him, uh, we were baptized uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, and he said, that's wonderful. So they're not ashamed. And now they're going to church. And now they're inviting their sons to go to church with them. Hear me today. God, uh, God's not going to do things the way you think he's going to do it. Uh, he's not going to work it out like you think he's going to work it out. Uh, it's when you get tired of living your life like you're living it. Come on, Ron and Tab on the back here. Ron, Ron came to see me. He was suffering from what they thought was depression. I told him it ain't depression. His mama was worried about it. His, his, his stepdad's worried about it. Ron was worried about himself. He didn't know what he needed. So he came to see me. It was last, what was it, last November? About a year ago. About a year ago. Came to see me. I'm not going to embarrass him, but he came to see me. He said, I don't know what's wrong with me. He said, a few months ago, I decided I'd come to church. I've got everything else, nothing else working. I might as well go to church. So I told my mama, for nine days, I'll go to church. But it wasn't 90 days. Like six months later, he still ain't missing church. He just showed up. He's still coming to church. He's not, he's not sure everything's going on. He knows he's got two little girls he loves. And these little girls love to come to church. They love to come to the altar and pray. And, and, and what's wrong? They come to the altar and pray. Wrong. wrong. want to go up there. But he just sit back. Just. And so we're sitting there talking. He said, I don't know what it is. He said, hey, I'm just not like everybody else. I don't care about going to the clubs. I don't care about dancing. I don't care about drinking. I don't care about all those other things. That's just not me. I said, you know what, no, I don't think you're depressed though. I think you're too long. He said, huh? I said, I think you need an apostolic girl full of the Holy Ghost. I said, huh? I said, I never heard you. I never thought of her. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to be baptized in Jesus' name. You need to God to change your life. And don't get worried about that. God will take care of this. Well, there they sit. God not only filled with the Holy Ghost, He's baptized in Jesus' name. He's an usher, and He's in the Word, and work with God and His wife. That depression, whatever it was, was gone. But let me tell you something. It had to get Him to a place that was down to nothing. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I feel so empty. I feel so out. Let me tell you something today. If that's the way you're feeling, you're in the right place at the right time. tell you something. When you're an empty vessel, God's got something to put in your empty vessel. You hear me? When you empty yourself out, God then can build you up. Too many times we roll into church and we like we're rolling into a service station with full service and we say, fill it up, man! About the time you get it filled up, you get ready to, you pull up to God and say, fill it up! He said, I can't. You're already full. The problem is you fully yourself. Come on now. I'm not being hard. I'm just being plain today. Somewhere we got to empty ourselves out. She said, I don't have anything. You know, when you look at it, it don't look like you've got very much. You know, all you've got is a pot of oil. But let me tell you something. God turned that pot of oil. Read, read quickly. i got to hurry. Said, borrow not even a few. Say, bar a bunch of vessels. Yeah, when thou art come, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shall pour out into all the vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. He said, you take that one pot you got, it's not very big, but you fill up all the big ones. Just fill them all up. Just keep pouring, keep pouring, keep pouring. Read. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons and brought the vessels to her, and she poured out, and it came to pass. Now the cool part of this, she said to her, 
her sons that read the part, she shut the door upon her and her sons that what? Brought the vessels to her. Now you gotta understand something. The boys were the ones bringing the vessels. The boys were also the ones that were being sold into slavery. Hmm. Mama, get us out of this. Mama said, you got to go part. Come on now. Everybody's got a part to do. We always want somebody else to do it for us and take care of everything. But every one of them had a part in it. The two boys and Mama all had a part in it. Don't you know it's kind of dumb for them boys to go next door? Mrs. Johnson, can I have a vessel? You have an empty pot I can? Yeah, what you need it for? I don't know. Mama just said go get it. She, they're dragging the pots in their empty pot. Here you go, Mama. Miss Johnson gave us two. We'll go down to Miss McGillicuddy, see what she's got. And they're knocking on the door. You got any empty pots we can have? We need some empty pots. What do you need? I don't know. Mama just said gather them up. You know what? Sometimes it's not going to make any sense how God wants to do it. Get over it. God's ways are above your ways. He's ready to do what you have. You'll finally turn it over to God. Say, God, here it is. Here's my broken mess. Worse than Humpty Dumpty. God, can you put it all back together? And He ain't going to put it together the way you want it to. He's going to fix it like it should have been to start with. Say, then go and get them. They shut the door. And the boys called to read them quickly. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me another vessel. Bring me another pot, boy. He said unto her, There's not a vessel more. Mom, there ain't no more. The oil stayed. Now you gotta understand the oil stayed. They kept waiting for it to evaporate. They kept waiting for it to go somewhere. I imagine the two boys. I know how the boys are. I had three brothers. I can see them right now. Junior, it's dumb to bring this many pots. I don't know why I'm getting pot. Mama said, go get pot. I'm tired of getting pot. You tired of getting pot? Tired of getting pot. Mama, how come we gotta go with more pot? Go get this pot. How many is enough? He didn't tell me how many. He said, borrow not a few. So we're gonna get a bunch of them. This is dumb. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. How come I got to do this? This is too much to do. There's too many rules and regulations. There's too many restrictions. I don't like this. This is dumb. I don't like how we have to do this. Come on now. Somebody better hear me today. I'm preaching to somebody. I'm talking to somebody right where you live. I'm getting right where your home spot is right now. No, no. Drag a few more of it. Because here's the thing. The Bible said when they quit pouring that this oil stayed. Now listen to the good part. Read it. Now when they were down to nothing, you got to understand, they go to jail. They're not just jail. They're going to go be slaves. They're going to do everything they're told to do for years to come. God, the, the man of God didn't tell them what was going to happen when they poured the oil. The man of God didn't even tell them they were going to pour the oil that she had. All he said was just go get the pot. When Jesus turned the water into wine, the first miracle, he told the servants, go get the water pot and fill them up. They didn't know what for. He might have been going to take a bath. You need to quit trying to tell God what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. You ain't down to nothing when you're at that point. When you ain't down to nothing, you pretty well do what you feel. Or what you feel. But you should do. But read on quickly. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell. Okay, he said, Hey, hey I got a house for all that. We struck an 